together, right? We got to we gotta take it from the inside and put it on the outside and say yay, uh, because I hope that's exactly the, the, uh, the emotion we feel when we get to walk through these doors on Sunday morning. Yay. Um, it is absolutely the emotion I feel. Um, it's good to be here. Welcome to State Street. We are so very glad that you are with us today. Um, it's a good day. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but you are surrounded by some pretty wonderful people. And so Smile at each other, notice each other, look each other full in the face, right? I know it's awkward. Um, but it's a good thing to recognize and see each other and see the goodness of God in each other. Um, we are so glad you're with us today. We're going to lean into the hope that comes from knowing the goodness of God. And we're glad that you're here with us to do just that. Welcome. to the face of my enemy. I see my brother. I see my brother. And when I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. I see my brother.
into the face of my enemy. I see my brother. I see my brother. Forgiveness is the garment of our courage. The power to make the peace we long to know. And open up our eyes to see the wounds that bind all of humankind. And may our shudder hearts greet the dawn of light with charity. Come with fire that refines, water that refreshes, wind that topples, breath that fills. Give us an abundance of grace for others and ourselves. Grant us compassion for those who suffer. Free us from the influence of money, power, and acclaim. Encourage us so we do not grow cynical, isolated, and burnt out. Fan our hopes, our joys, and our connections. Allow us rest when we need rest. Enable us to see you in each person we encounter. Show us mercy in our humanity. Let us love more fully than we thought possible. Let us not be quick on the draw, ready to retaliate, escalate, or assassinate. Let us stand for love and with love, following the way of your son as best we are able. Let us not fear spirituality. Let us listen to the wondrous bodies that you have given us. Let us hear your voice and tangibly feel you with us. Let us discern your guidance. Let us abide in and with you. Show us what you're doing so we can work together. Move where you will, when you will, in whatever way you will. Come Holy Spirit. Come. Merciful God, so much has gone wrong. In the evil we've spoken, in the good we've not done. Heavy the darkness hangs on us, will you turn the light back on? Have mercy on us. Have mercy, Lord.
I had to pee. Oh. 
I did. I'm like, I think I have enough time. I didn't know the songs were shorter today, to be fair. And then I washed my hands, all right? Jeez, I feel very pressured right now. I'm trying to be my authentic self. All right, welcome to State Street Community Church. If you're new with us, that was fun for you. Um, my name is Nate Lox. I'm the lead pastor here at State Street Community Church. We're just glad that you're here. Uh, we hope that you take this time uh, to reflect on your life and your relationship with Christ and to your own humanity and that you feel that um, you have a space to belong here. Wherever you're at in your faith, uh, whatever your background is, that um, y- you do have a space at the table here at State Street Community Church. If you're streaming with us, welcome as well. I know that churches can be uh, hard to, to go to, and I know uh, faith is a very important element in many of our lives, and it can be vulnerable to go to a church, and maybe you're exploring us online for the first time, or maybe you're not in this community. I, I want you to know as well, we welcome you, and we're just glad that you're here. Uh, we start a new series today called 12, and before we do, will you pray with me? Dear God, in your wisdom, you have taught us that genuine humility does not come from thinking poorly of ourselves, but instead from thinking less about ourselves and focusing on the needs and well-being of those around us. Please guide us to embody this truth in our daily interactions, knowing that by lifting others up, we draw nearer to the divine love you desire for us to spread. Amen. So, um, I remember calling my father and letting him know that I was going to become, or that I, I didn't even ask him actually, I changed it without asking him that I'm, I'm now a philosophy major at college, and I, I, my dad was a, is a construction guy. He didn't go to college. He, he just took over our family construction business, the concrete construction business that my grandfather, and he grew that. And so I, I called him and I said, hey, dad, just to let you know, I changed my major to philosophy. And he said, so you're a Bible major and you're a philosophy major. And I could just hear it in his head going, Whoa. Is he going to be on the payroll forever, or what's he going to do in life? And the thing that attracted me the most to philosophy was that it engaged the deeper questions of life. I love the deeper questions of life. What is love? What is justice? What is hope? What is mercy? How to best understand it and cultivate it? What is virtue and vices? How do we define virtue and vice? How is religion and, and spirituality influence all of those things? But one of the questions that is the most foundational question in all of philosophy that so many philosophers have sought to answer is what is a well-lived life? Like at the end of our life, how do we know that we've lived it well? How can we tell that the time that we've spent on this earth it has not been wasted? Is it, is it good to spend time loving others and being loved by others? Well, who, who decides Who says that's a good thing? Is it good or bad to accumulate things? If it's at the expense of others, is it bad or is it good? Is it just the goal is to end up with the most stuff? Who decides that? What is a well-lived life? Now, many of us might answer that question in different ways, right? Oftentimes based on our background, right? Some of us might say, what is the well-lived life? For me, is a secure life. What is a well-lived life? A life that is uh, full of love and and, and relationships. Some of us might say the well-lived life is doing things that you love to do and feeling fulfilled by it. Some of us might say, you know, the the well-lived life is, is just a ton of success. And so you spend your time and your energy and your efforts in this life just trying to build success and build notoriety because for you, the well-lived life at the end is, is, is to get as much success as you can. Maybe, again, your answer to that is, is in money and security because maybe you didn't grow up having a lot. And so the well-lived life is a reaction to what you had as a child or as, as somebody growing up much younger and you know what it was like to be in poverty. You know, it's, it always amazes me when people say, you know, money's not everything. I know most people aren't saying it's everything, but it is something if you've never had money. And so maybe for you, your attachment to money and, and, and maybe not having enough 
is then focused on accumulating more wealth, accumulating more money so you feel secure in this life, and that is the well-lived life. Maybe for you it's having a bigger family. You felt lonely in life. You felt lonely in your existence, and you, you know that maybe the, the best memories of your life, the best memories of your existence is having more people around you, and so the well-lived life is having a bigger family. Maybe it's finding somebody to spend that time with. Well-lived life is, is finding a, a partner and somebody to, to love well and be loved well. I think we'd all maybe have slightly different answers about what the well-lived life is. But I typically look at all of these questions through the lens of what I know about faith, what I know about our humanity, what I know about meaning and purpose. And I can't answer all of these questions without the biases I have. Right? My, my faith is, is, is integrally important to me. It, is, it has helped me move through some of the deepest uh, and, and most challenging points of my life. It has helped me see people through the lens of the image of God, which has helped me love people better, be more gracious with others, to look in the mirror and see my own value and worth more, because God does not create junk. And so... I answer these questions through the lens of I, I believe in a God that loves and a humanity that is well-loved. And so for me, the goal of a well-lived life is not to suppress my desires, right? So the idea that I, I, I want to have a better career or I want to have you know, a, a house or I want to have a car or I want to have a family, I want to have somebody to spend my life with, I want to have all these things, I want to have an education, I, that is not anything that needs to be suppressed. Those are good desires. They're not bad desires. Most of our desires, to be truthful, are neither good nor bad. They're just there. What happens is how we allow our desires to point our life. How we allow our desires to dictate our actions. Right? And so for us, the goal of a well-lived life is not to suppress our desires, but to transform them into something more like Christ. To say, I'm going to allow my desires to be transformed in light of the love that I receive from Christ and the love that I'm allowed to show others. To reflect that, that, that incredible love that I receive back to the world around me. It's a constant kind of asking questions about why I want this thing so badly? Do I think that if I get this thing that I'll finally be happy? Because if you're waiting for something to happen, to finally experience happiness and contentment, I promise you, that thing will only give you momentary and temporary happiness. The goal of a well-lived life is not to suppress our desires, but to transform them into something more like Christ. You know, people often gathered around Jesus because, um, obviously, you know, you, you come to, around Jesus and you want to see miracles, you want to see all these things. But typically, in the scriptures, when people are gathered around Jesus, it was because of his teachings. It was because he was engaging their thoughts and their, their rational selves about what is good and bad, what is holy and just, what is, what is like God and what is not. How do we understand the feelings that we have? How do we understand our neighbors better? And, and they were just kind of drawn to this idea of a different world that didn't look like the world they lived in. The motivations of the current systems they lived in looked very different than the world that Jesus was describing. The way that love looked in the way that Jesus, in the kingdom of God, as Jesus was describing it, looked very different than the love that they had heard on the streets of that day. The way forgiveness looked and the offer to live within the forgiveness of God in the kingdom of God looked very different than the forgiveness that they had seen in the days that people were drawn to this idea that maybe, maybe Christ is showing us a world that is possible but not already existing. And we are allowed to believe that this world that Christ is inviting us into can exist if we build it. You know, I love studying the disciples of Jesus. I love humanizing the disciples of Jesus. If you've been here long enough, you know that one of the things that we love to do is contextualize the scriptures, look at the people, not just the words, 
look at the situations and the context, not just, not just the words. And so we like to kind of get behind the scriptures, peel back the layers of it. And one of the things that you find really quickly when you study the lives of the disciples is that these are ordinary people on an extraordinary mission. That, that, that Christ has, has formed for himself a community of people filled with very ordinary types of people. They are not the, the upper echelon of society. And we're, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to discover more about the personalities and the people that made up the, the disciples, the 12 that followed Jesus. But in that group, you have you know, what the scriptures say, untrained idiots. That's what the scriptures call a couple of the disciples, right? Untrained, unschooled idiotes. Simples, simpletons, simple people. And then you have smart people. You have uh, tax collectors. You have people that understood finance and money really well. You have a passionate people, like, like a religious zealot that is passionate about justice and passionate about things being made right again and, and willing to go to violent means to build the world that, that they think is, is right. Then you have people that have been trained in in the scriptures as well. You have all these ordinary people coming together to form this extraordinary early community around Christ. Frederick Buechner is an author that uh, has written significant amounts of of literature. But if you like to read Frederick Buechner's For You, he's he's just a fantastic writer, um, but also a, a, a wonderful theologian as well. But he wrote a book called Beyond Words, Daily Readings and the ABCs of Faith. And in this, he talks about the disciples. He says, the first ministers were the 12 disciples. There's no evidence that Jesus chose them because they are brighter or nicer than other people. Their sole qualification seems to have been their initial willingness to rise to their feet when Jesus said, follow me. And so we try to take our faith and obviously talk about the intricacies of our faith, to talk about the delicate nature of what we're called to do in our faith, the nuance of the world that we live in. But in the end, our discipleship is just literally those who say we are following Jesus. And we try to look and say, do our confessions and our convictions match up? Do the things that we say to be true match up with the things that we we do? Because if not, then are we truly following Christ? Are we being diligent to the calling that Christ has on us? Or are we just saying we are? Because, right, oftentimes you've had people in your life that say they love you, but their actions don't look anything like love. And then you have to sometimes wonder, then do you really love me? Or you have maybe met somebody and you've wronged them and they say, I forgive you, but their actions look nothing like forgiveness. And you wonder, have you really forgiven me? To be a disciple of Jesus is just to be a person that follows Christ. Imperfectly, but still tries. And so, as a quick note, if anybody has shamed you or judged you for your faith, and maybe because the, the things that you do or the things that you have said, or because of mistakes you have made, or as you go on the journey of life, you've not lived a perfect life, and they have tried to take away your identity and faith, I hope you know that your faith And your connection to Christ is not contingent on somebody else's judgment of you. Faith is about who we are following and where we're pointing our life to. And when Jesus says, follow me, he's not calling extraordinary people. He's calling ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So in this series, we're going to be talking about these extraordinary mission, this extraordinary mission from these ordinary men and 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 study how we can learn to kind of practice similarly, but also to give grace and experiences that they have. Oftentimes the disciples get rebuked. They get, they get kind of a, a, a stern talking to from Jesus, even though they're the closest to Jesus because they didn't get the mission of Christ, the mission of God. 
We're not trying to judge the disciples in this series. We're not going to look at them as, as anything other than just examples of, of the struggle that you and I also go through as we follow Christ. The disciples of Jesus were not perfect, nor are we. But we can learn something from their testimony and their example about grace, about humility, about love, about community. And we're going to do that over the next couple of weeks. You know, faith is not meant to be practiced alone. It's just not. I know all of us have a personal faith and all of us enjoy a personal faith. But faith as a whole is not meant to be practiced alone. We do this in community and with the testimony of the church throughout history. Because faith best practiced is one that knows others and is being willing to be known by others. Have you ever had an experience where your pride was exploited and immediately turned into humility? This happens more than I wish to admit, where I come in overconfident and I have to learn that my confidence was certainly unfounded. I remember not long ago this year, um, my buddy Drew over there introduced me to the Old Man's Basketball League, and I went into this Old Man's Basketball League, and I'll have you know, even though I am a a graying 42-year-old, I went to the Old Man's Basketball League, and I felt like a young buck. I was one of the youngest people there, and I was the tallest person there by a couple inches. And so I went into this league, you know, I hadn't played basketball much in a while. And these men who were 50s, 60s, 70s had been playing every week pretty much for 20 to 25 years. But they are older men. They, they do that thing where when they stand up, they don't realize that they grunt, right? But just to get their body going, they have to make a sound, right? You, those of you might know that, right? It's like... Ugh, and you don't realize it. It just kind of comes out, right? It, it is the thing that, that just helps your body move. And they, make, they made that sound, just, just running sometimes. And when they ran, you kind of heard creaks, you know, in their knees and stuff like that. And I go in there somewhat confident because I'm like, you know what? The thing about basketball is the taller you are, the better it is. And so I go in there and they pick teams and I don't, Here's, this is honestly where I knew pride cometh before the fall. <laughs> the way they pick teams is you line up on the free throw line and the first five or first four that make it are on one team, the next four that make it are on another team. I was number nine and I didn't get to shoot because the first eight made it. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and so we, we, they start playing, and I'm like, oh, okay, all right, all right. They're, they're active, they're running, they're, they're, they're competitive, okay. And then one team loses, the other team goes in, and I go in with my team, and I've been talking to this older gentleman, and, and he's, you know, kind of trying to encourage me. It's going to be fine, you know. you got to call your own fouls. Well, huh, I'm not calling a foul. I know how this is. And so I get in there, and... Um, I, I, I get, you know, fed down at the post, and then I get assaulted. <laughs> Literally could have filed a police report on some of these. <laughs> but I'm not calling a foul. And, and I think there's a little bit of enjoyment there that I'm not, and also permission to just keep violating me further. And so we're going, and I, you know, I get, you know, one time you're supposed to call your own fouls. One time another guy did call the foul. He's like, I'm just going to call that. Come on now. You know, I'm like, oh, thank you so much. I'm like hobbled over, right? (laughs) And so I'm guarding one of these guys, and, you know, I'm thinking, all right, all right, I I got this, right? I mean, I'm I'm not a gazelle like these young bucks, but I'm okay. And so, you know, that's my, my... my motto in life is I'm adequate. And so I, the guy comes up and, you know, I'm, I'm standing back from him because I don't want him to like, you know, slow break around me. He can't fast break, but he can slow break around me. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving enough space. And this older guy who, um, you know, clearly is wearing his age on his face, um, pulls up right in front of me, shoots a three and nails it. All right. All right. I only got one lung, I tell him. <laughs> so we run back, and, you know, I, I miss a layup because 
I'm not that great. And so we go back up and again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get, you know, they're, they're boxing me out and they're, I, I, I'm literally going, I don't know what's going on here. You know, like, you know, and he, he sets a pick for me and this old man, I'm not kidding you, in his 70s, gets fed the ball, shoots a three, makes it again. And I kid you not, I am, I am 99% sure he winked at me. I left that day very humbled, called Drew, and Drew said, are you tired? Are you sore? It's going to last for days. <laughs> and it did. It did. So the next time I came in, I was a lot more humble. I was humbled. This also happens every time I go to the mechanic. Every time I go to the mechanic, I want to be a man and admit that I know all the stuff that they know, but I know nothing that they know. When they tell me something needs to be replaced, they use a lot of words I've never heard. But I do what most men do when they're being talked to by other men that they don't understand. They just nod. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the blinker fluid. Yeah, uh-huh. I thought that was, you know, I, I thought that was low. I did. Yeah, no. Um, you got to top that off. You know, you got to top that off. You know, I, it just, the last mechanic, he didn't understand it either, you know. And I remember going to the mechanic not actually that long ago, and he's explaining to me all the things that might be wrong, and I'm just nodding. Uh-huh. He's like, oh, so you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. So what do you want, option A or B? I didn't hear the options. I don't know. There's a lot of words I don't understand, right? Option A or B? I'm like, uh-huh. Um, you know what? I, I think I'm going to go pray about it because I don't know what I want to do. And then I'm going to go Google, right? Because I don't understand. Where your, your pride is exploited because you want to project something or someone to somebody else. Because you are afraid that who you are isn't good enough, and it's immediately turned into humility. What would happen if we are, were okay with who we are, and we were confident in what we know and don't know, and our default position was an open hand and an open heart and an open mind that was humble? That I don't have to put up a facade of things that I know or don't know. That I, I don't have to show anybody that I know this just to prove to them that I'm somebody or something. I'm just open hand, open minded, and open hearted enough to be humble. There's a lot of the world, a lot of my own self, a lot of this existence, a lot about God that I don't know. Let's open your Bibles if you have them. If not, that is okay. Download our Safe Street mobile app and you will find a Bible in there. You'll find the sermon notes in there. You'll find a prayer request. All kinds of fun things in our, our, our State Street mobile app. And I looked at this morning. Mark 9, chapter 9, verse 33. Then they came. The disciples came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house... This is Jesus. When Jesus was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. When I know Jesus never had any children, but I think Jesus understood what having children is like. What were you guys arguing about? Have you ever done this with your kids before? What are you guys arguing about? And you go into their room and you hear them fighting and arguing and they just look at you, nothing. What were you arguing about on the way, Jesus says, but they were silent, nothing. Nothing. For on the way, they had argued with one another as who was the greatest. I'm better than you. I mean, I don't know if you saw this. When Jesus and I were walking, he kind of pulled me aside because he wanted to talk about something. So I understand. This is, this is the conversation my brothers and I probably would have had growing up. My brothers, <laughs> I don't know, is Brandon here? No, okay, we'll talk about him. Um, my brother, Brandon's big thing was, Nate, I, I just hope you know that as the, the fourth child, you kind of just got whatever was left. <laughs> Think about that as a kid. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. And I think about that. And I'm like, oh, this is this is exactly what probably Jesus had to deal with, right? Infighting, men who are children, people that their pride got in the way, their vulnerabilities, right? Because everyone wants to be close to Jesus, and the closer they are to Jesus, they feel the more value they have. 
but they don't understand the nature of the, the, the kingdom and the, the community that Christ is building. Because if you want to be close to Christ, you'll actually push yourself back a little bit and let others come forward. They were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last in servant at all. We talk about this sometimes. It's the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. Who, who is first will be last, last will be first, right? Who is hungry will be, will be fed. Who is thirsty, their thirst will be quenched, right? There's this upside-down nature of the kingdom, and Jesus wants them to understand, listen, listen, you're worried, your ego is speaking to you about who is the greatest among you, who is the toughest, who knows the most, who has the best spirituality, who is closer to Christ, who sins the less. But I want you to know that if you really want to connect deeper to your faith and you want to get out of the way of your own ego and pride... Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And the reason Jesus is, is, is saying this is because this is the life of Christ. Look at the, 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 we just celebrated Easter. Those of you that are Easter services, thank you so much. If you're new on our Easter services, so glad to have you. If you stream with us, it was a great weekend. We had a lot of people. It was so good to see so many new people, people that hadn't been here for a while. It was just, we, our whole staff left energized. It was so wonderful to see you here. But on Easter, we, we, we reflect on the, the, the resurrection of Christ, right? But before the resurrection is the crucifixion. And the God of humanity is on a cross getting brutally murdered and ridiculed and lied about and abandoned by these very disciples to declare victory over death. So Jesus is saying, well, first must be last of all and different of all because that's the heart of Christ. That's the example of Christ. But what is getting in the way? Our pride, our ego, our love of self sometimes at the expense of others. Look at um, Mark 9, chapter 30, or verse 33 through 37 goes on. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Pride. If you want to be Connected to Christ, you'll understand that at the heart of Christ is a humble heart. Not one that judges, not one that pushes out or pushes aside, but one that humbly is open, with open hearts and open minds and open hands to the work of love and justice that Christ does in this world. I love that Jesus uses children because it's, it's not di that dissimilar to our own country, but we, I think we do a much better job than the first century did. In the first century Greco-Roman times, children were at the bottom rung of influence, right? They were at the bottom because they were contingent on everyone else for survival. So a child didn't have any rights. You didn't worry about whether a child was well-loved. They were at the bottom rung of society. Children were um, uh, oppressed oftentimes. They were um, uh, taken advantage of because they were at the bottom rung of society. And so when the disciples hear this, Jesus says, listen, if you want to understand the heart of God, you will understand we're at the bottom rung of society. You will understand those who are on the bottom of influence. Those who you think have nothing to give. Whoever welcomes one such child on the bottom of influence welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. James talks about pride, right? But he gives all the more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That God actually stands against Pride stands against those who love self over the expense of others, who are only worried about what they can get. Have you ever been in a relationship with someone, friendship or romantic relationship, where it's only about them? It's only about what they can get. Their reaction and relationship with you is only a manipulative way to get more from you. God opposes the proud but gives grace 
to the humble, those with open hands, open hearts, and open minds. Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Focus on your ego, wondering why you want to do this, why you feel this way. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not, or look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. You know, one of the issues with pride is it prioritizes self above God and the community, ultimately excluding both. When you're only focused on what you lack and what you can get, it's hard to focus on God and others. It's just how our mind works. It's how our bi biology works. We're only focused on one thing and what we don't have or what we need and what we lack. Pride prioritizes the self above God and the community, ultimately excluding both. And why is that so terrible? Well, pride is problematic because it revolves solely around the self, and the kingdom of God invites us to believe that life is just not about us. It's not that you're not important. It's not that you're not loved. It's not that you shouldn't receive love. It's not that you shouldn't receive your worth and value. But life ultimately is not about me or you. You shouldn't disregard yourself. You shouldn't disregard your desires. But we should worry about our ego. We should ask sometimes why we feel and think the way we do. It's a dysfunction because it causes us to focus on serving ourselves rather than others. And life is about loving others and loving God and being loved in return. You know, researchers at the University of London concluded that a substantial majority of individuals believe themselves to be morally superior to the average person, and that this illusion that we live with is uniquely strong and prevalent. We believe, a majority of people, a majority of humans believe that other people, others, are worse morally than us. You judgers. The, the study writes, most people strongly believe that they are just, that they are virtuous, that they are moral, yet regard the average person as distinctly less so. Why is that? Why do we think that we are more morally superior, but others aren't? But I'm going to tell you this. This is nothing new. This happens all the time. This is the heart of judgmentalism, right? This is the heart of pushing people outside. Is we believe that we, or people like us, can be or are morally superior or morally virtuous more so than the people that are not like us. But Christ invites us to believe that everyone is created in the image of God. That no one is better than anyone else. And even though we say it, even though we, we kind of pay homage to it, we don't often live that way. Do you know why I think kids are really cool? I do. Um, until they get to a certain age, then they, they're just awful. But like, and then they grow past that, and then they become cool again. There's that age, though, where it's like, yeah, you're, you're hard to deal with. Um, but young kids are really cool. Our preschool here, super cool. I think they're, 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 they're just so much fun. This week, um, Miss Kathy was setting up uh, this course. And this course had like uh, these cones. And it was like a race. And it was like cones every like five feet and maybe six cones. And then at the center of the last cone, you had to touch one of the cones and then come back down. And so I get there and Miss Kathy says, uh, Pastor Nate's, we're going we're gonna to go against each other and show the kids how to do it. Now, Miss Kathy has had some injuries, so I knew I was going to win. 
And so um, she messed up her knee and stuff. So I'm like, ah, I got this one. And guess what, guys? No, I won big time. I won so badly. Because she's like, well, it's not fair because you have like giraffe legs. And, and I do. And it's like, yeah, they, they do me no good ever, but I won this one. And then the kids see it, and they're cheering for both of us, right? And then it's their turn, and it's their turn to go. And, 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 and their, Miss Kathy pairs them up, and she pairs them up, and they, they come, and they start, you know, going through the race, and they're cheering each other on. They're not getting upset at who loses or who wins. Half of them start running, then they lose interest halfway through, and they're, like, lost, And what I, 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 I loved about watching them is there was no ego. There wasn't. And as soon as Miss Kathy lost to me, they felt so bad for Miss Kathy. It's really easy to become a villain in the preschool, clearly. <laughs> you just got to beat Miss Kathy or something. And they, they felt so bad. And then, and then as soon as... As soon as one person, because, you know, I play up the villain role sometimes, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a humble winner. And, um, and so then, you know, uh, they, they look at me, and they're laughing at me. And, and then if they feel like I'm being picked on, then they get sad for me as well. And then half of them will start saying, I love you, Pastor Nate, because, again, it's not about their ego or their self. It's about giving love because they've received love. It's about focusing on others. It's about sharing with others. It's about believing the best about others. You know, kids are great, um, but oftentimes they're delusional. My son once believed that I could beat up the rock. <laughs> Not a rock, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, <laughs> whose neck is bigger than my body. But he believed that because at his age, and being as young as he was, he believed his dad was invincible. Now, he wouldn't say that today. He'd be like, Dad, you're going to get pummeled. And you know what? He's right. But because he believed the best about his dad, but because his dad, for him, was so strong, he, he just, there was no ego there. There was no, it was just unadulterated love. As we age, our pride, our sense of pride and our ego can become increasingly destructive. I've seen this in myself. This can lead to many difficulties in relationships, right? Where you focus on yourself instead of others. When you're, it's only about what you lack instead of what you can give. It, it's about what you don't have instead of all of the gifts that you do have. And as we lose the ability to reflect on important issues, our pride can just well up a little bit more and more as we go. Over in the kids' wing, you'll see we've got this like little, little sign, and it's a, a summary of this scripture in Micah 6 8. Micah 6 8 says, He has told you, O mortal, O human, what is good. Here's what is good. This is what God said is good. It's not that complex. It's not, you could memorize this first, but if you want to know in faith what is the well lived life, what is human flourishing, what it means to actually have meaning and purpose, Micah says this do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with God, to walk with an open hand an open heart, and an open mind to the world that God is building, to an experience with God that maybe you haven't had yet, to being willing to admit that maybe you don't have all the answers. Maybe you've been saying you're okay, but you're really not. Maybe something's been bothering you underneath the surfaces. We all have layers that we've not gotten to yet. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. You know, as, as I end this, I want to give one nuanced view as well. Because this, this is where we go sometimes with this, right? We have this false humility where our humility turns into self-loathing. That we're not any good. Everyone's better than us. That we don't have anything to give. 
that, that we need to not, not have any sense of, of confidence or boldness. Some of you are incredibly skilled at things. Some of you are incredibly gifted at things. And you should own that. You should know that. You should be comfortable with that truth. Because humility is not self-hate. And, and sometimes we get that mixed up, right? So people will say, hey, you're really good at that. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. I've told you, I don't know how to receive a compliment really well. Because everything in me says, you know, push against that because you need to be humble. You need to be, but really what they're saying is this gift that you have, I recognize it. And it's not bad to say thank you. It's not bad to say you're right. I, I do believe that God has gifted me with this talent or with this thing or this possession or with this skill. And it's okay. Humility is not self-hate. That is not what God wants any of us to do is to hate ourselves. If anything, you should be so bold and confident in who God has made you to be that you don't feel competitive with other people. That you don't feel like you have to, to, to diminish anybody else to raise yourself up. Humility is not about self-hate. It's about recognizing who you are and how God has made you and looking in the mirror and seeing a person created in the image of God that is loved fully by God, that is forgiven fully by God, that is given all the tools to demonstrate the grace and the hope and the forgiveness that God calls us into because you are a human that has been created and flourishes in love. Not hate. Humility is not about thinking less of yourself. It's just not. Some of you need to work on that. Don't think less of yourself. Don't diminish yourself. Don't hate yourself. Don't think that God hates you. Humility is thinking of yourself a little bit less. Right? It's being willing to be open to others' experiences, to others' needs, to prioritize others maybe at times above yourself and say, listen, I understand my ego speaks to me in such a way that, that pushes against this, but I know that to form a community, to form a family, to form a bond, to form a romantic partnership, to, to form all of these things, I need to, to combat my ego because everything in me talks about what I need instead of what I can give. Humility means also recognizing your own worth, your own value, your talents, but also recognizing that they come from God as a gift to the world around you, not as a commodity to own yourself. Humility is about recognizing that everything we have, this life, this gathering, this interaction that you and I have is a gift from God. We don't know how long any of us have on this earth. We, don't, we are not guaranteed any time. Every day we get with the people that we love, every opportunity we get to love others well and to receive love, others, uh, to receive love from others well is a gift from God. Humility is about understanding that. It's not about self-hate. Humility is about understanding that we're, the world around us is much bigger than our perception of it. And people are a lot more complex than the performances they put on. And God is much greater than our perception of him. You know, the number one concept taught in the scripture is, it's not humility, I was leading you into that, it's love. But number two is humility. Love and humility. Love is number one, then humility. Because I think in order to love well, we have to be willing to open up our hands. We have to be willing to open up our hearts. We have to be willing to open up our minds to an experience and an existence that is, that has, is full of possibility and potential. And that promotes a receptive mindset. Some of us don't have a receptive mindset. Some of us are, are just about building up walls or pushing out when humility allows us to receive. It gives us an ability to have openness to learning and the ability to genuinely connect with others without fear of what 
they have or what we lack. But remember this, as we study the life of the disciples, as these disciples get gently rebuked by Christ for their pride and for their lack of humility and misunderstanding, know this though, the disciples were just ordinary people called to an extraordinary mission. And so are you. And as we enter into the Eucharist together, I want you to know you are invited to the tables of Christ. And as people that have declared that Jesus is Lord, that, that are just trying to follow Christ in the ways that we love, in the ways that we show justice, in the ways that we make peace, we also have to admit that we don't always do the reflection necessary about our words and our actions, about our desires and our passions. And sometimes they're misplaced. Sometimes we hate others and sometimes we hate ourselves. Sometimes we judge others and sometimes we judge ourselves. Sometimes we, we build up walls between others because we don't like them and sometimes we build walls because we don't want them to know us. But as we reflect and we repent, we ask for forgiveness of the areas of our life where we choose hatred over love, where we choose judgment over mercy, where we've decided that our own ego, serving that and cultivating that is better than the mission of God that exists to love God and love others. And to love well and be loved well in return. So as we enter into this Eucharist, as we give thanks for the good and gracious gift that is Jesus, will you pray the Lord's Prayer with us? Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Hey, uh, will you please stand before we dismiss? I need you to do me a quick favor as the lights come up a little bit. Um, will you please introduce yourself to somebody and say, hey, hey, champ, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you're here today, friend. Thank you. Hello, champ. Thanks for coming here. Why does it get so hot when I preach? Does the air conditioning get turned off? Oh, so hot. So hot. It wasn't the pressure. It's just hot. It's hot in here. Or the lights that are like six degrees too hot. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's me again. Um, hey, real quick, I, I'm, we're so grateful that you're here. We got a couple things before you leave. Uh, we have an event coming up here for the PAC Center on May 10th called Locally Sourced. If you have your mobile app, you'll see on the front page of that, you'll see a graphic for it and all the information for it. It is an event that we're doing. Uh, for a couple reasons. We want to ben benefit the, the mission of the PAC Center to keep LaPorte County well-fed and well-loved, but also to highlight local restaurants and artists and musicians uh, because we believe in, in the importance of place. We, we believe that uh, as a community, we should support each other. Even those that don't share your faith background or your cultural background, that we are better together. And so we're having this event. It's a Friday night, May 10th at the Civic Auditorium. All the information is online. It's also, like I said, in your mobile app. Um, we need a couple things from you. Their tickets are $40, but you get $20 of that to go towards different food, uh, to try different local you know, vendors and stuff like that. Uh, the rest of it goes to the PAC Center. If you have a business or you want to be involved in sponsoring that event, let us know. Let me or Jamie Buchanan know. We'd love to, to have you as a sponsor as well. Um, please share the information online and get as many people as you can to come. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is family friendly. You can bring your kids as well. And um, again, it's all to benefit uh, the PAC Center and our work uh, keeping LaPorte County well fed and well loved. We are not going to be passing a plate for offering here at State Street, though we do believe in honoring God with our finances. So if this is your church community, um, we invite you to give in a couple different ways. There are giving envelopes in the chair backs in front of you. You can uh, put any check or cash or anything like that and put it in the giving boxes in the foyer. Or you can do what like 80% of you do. Go online to statestreet.church backslash give and set up online donations. You could do just one or set up recurring, or you can do that through your mobile app as well. Every gift matters, whether it's $500 or five, $5 or $500. It's a big deal, and it helps us continue the mission of love and justice here at State Street. Also, through your mobile app, there's prayer requests. There's connect cards. If you'd like to serve, just let us know. We'd love to connect with you through the week. If you've not liked us on social media, please like us on Instagram, Facebook, just so that you can stay more informed with what's going on here. Again, I'm so grateful for you and that you're here. If you hear nothing else from me today, know that you are loved by God. And there's nothing you have done that has dissuaded God's incredible passion and love for you. So go out in the love of the Father and the peace of His Son, Jesus Christ. In the movement of the Holy Spirit, you are dismissed. Peace be with you.